Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Westcott. Uh, I'm head of faculty for BTRM, and I'm going to give you a very short presentation at the beginning of this uh, faculty open evening. Um, presentation will last for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, maybe a few minutes. Um, and then uh, there'll be a discussion with uh, some of my colleagues from the faculty, and we will try and answer any questions you've got, either from in the room here in London uh, or um, online. So firstly, just a little bit about me. Uh, my background is Treasury Risk Management. Uh, I spent uh, well, well over 20 years in the Treasury function of NatWest and uh, RBS banks in London um, in a whole variety of roles, uh, Treasury roles, uh, and particular experience uh, including things like uh, Divisional Treasurer uh, for the retail bank and then separately the corporate bank. Um, and uh, I led the implementation of Basel III in RBS as well. Okay, let's have a look at these slides. Uh, hopefully you've all got access to some slides. Uh, if not, you'll be able to pick them up later and sync them to uh, the way I talk through. Um, so from the slide deck, just moving on to number two, uh, this is a, a little summary of the bank treasury risk management journey. Uh, we started life in 2014 um, and uh, this Professor Morad Chowdhury who is in the room with us here uh, in London, uh, he's the guy who kicked it all off. Um, Morad's had lots of uh, experience uh, in the financial markets and as we will discover later he's written many many books. Uh, but Morad needed a partner to, to bring uh, this uh, to market and he joined forces with World Business Strategies in 2014 uh, to produce uh, a course that we're going to describe for you now. Um, you'll see uh, that actually tonight's open evening is about cohort five of the course. So uh, cohort one was began in 2014. Um, the, the cohorts used to be uh, six months in length uh, they're now extended to eight months in length and we'll talk through some of the changes a little bit later on. Uh, basically, uh, there's a few reasons for the extension. Uh, partly we want to pack in a bit more material, uh, but partly our students are finding it quite difficult to, to get through the material uh, in six months. So we're now giving them a little bit longer. Uh, we don't just deliver courses. Uh, We've had a variety of uh, conferences uh, and sessions in uh, places like uh, Dubai and Singapore, which you'll also see on the timeline. So what is bank treasury risk management about? Well, asset and liability management uh, is a, a core banking discipline that all banks need to manage. Uh, this course is predominantly about how banks manage their balance sheet exposures. Uh, critically, it, it's not uh, taught by uh, people just from an educational background, it's taught by practitioners predominantly. Um, and the practitioners have also developed the course. Um, so the critical benefit about, from that is that it has a lot, uh, basically a, a significant practical slant um, and hopefully uh, any students attending uh, will be equipped with the tools and te techniques that they need to, uh, should we say, uh, carry out asset and liability management in the workplace. Uh, also, uh, this, uh, this is a qualification at the end of this course. Uh, and it's the only uh, professional qualification of its type. There are others in the market like ACT, uh, but they're not specifically focused on banks, which this one is. Um, on slide four, there's a, a series of benefits. Uh, I have mentioned some of these points already, so I'll just pick up on two of these. Uh, the second one, Dan, qualified from anywhere in the world. 
so unlike many courses, uh, to take this one, you do not need to sit in a room in London every week. Uh, this course can be studied from absolutely anywhere in the world. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, a lot of our students come from outside the UK. Uh, and at the bottom as well, uh, I'll pick up on that. Uh, just taking the course is only part of the BTRM experience. Uh, there are a number of other learning opportunities, professional development opportunities, as well as the course. Uh, and just examples might include uh, regular papers that are published uh, and available from the VTRM website, webinars, uh, and uh, a, a large professional network that you have access to uh, once you have uh, become involved in this setup. So the Bank Treasury Risk Management Faculty. Well, another key point is that we don't teach the course with one or two lecturers. In total, there's 15. Um, and by having 15, it basically gives us access to professionals uh, who are expert in their fields. Uh, asset and liability management itself is quite a, a wide topic, uh, and as is treasury risk management. So by collating together uh, 15 experts, uh, we believe that we can cover all elements of the discipline thoroughly. Uh, we have here for you today uh, Professor Chowdhury, uh, who's the top dog here, <laughs> as you will see. Uh, I, I'm Chris Westcott. I'm the one uh, on the left, uh, uh, extreme left of the top line. Uh, we have Peter Eisenhart, who is uh, second from the right on the uh, top line. And we have Ed Base, who's third from the right uh, on the bottom line. Uh, we will all introduce ourselves, or oh, the other guys will introduce themselves a little bit later on. So our candidate history. Uh, recently, recent cohorts, there have been around about 50 candidates. Um, where do these candidates come from? Well, a whole variety of backgrounds. Um, they may be uh, asset liability management or treasury risk professionals. Um, they may be regulators. Uh, they may come from software companies. Um, or they may be linked to the finance industry in uh, another way. Um, so you'll, you'll see from the student profiles uh, at the bottom of slide six that it's quite broad. And you'll also see that the academic profile that's uh, suited to this course is also quite broad. Um, right, so on slide seven, we've got the global profile. And although 65% uh, of the students come from Europe, only uh, quite a small percentage come from the UK. Um, and that uh, profile is based on the cohorts one to four. The uh, background in terms of uh, institution that the uh, students work for um, is shown on slide eight. And you'll, you'll see here we've got a collection of uh, large banks, small banks, regulators, consultants, software companies, central banks. Um, and that probably covers most of them. Uh, but, uh, but critically from, oh, and there's also rating agencies. Um, Institutions that come from all over the, the world and are in some cases global, but in other cases just operating in their local uh, market. So if bank treasury risk management is, is for you, um, the experience starts with an open evening like this, um, where you get an opportunity to discuss the course and learn as much as you can about the course. Uh, if you're sold, there's an application process. Um, that is quite short, and you'll get a response within three days. Um, and then if you're ready for the beginning of the course, there's a, a primer uh, delivered by uh, Professor Chowdhury. Um, there are also a large number of books uh, that come in your direction, 
and we'll see some of those a little bit later. Um, in total, there are six modules to this course. Uh, and at the end of each module, there's an online test uh, that students are required to pass. That's a multiple choice test. At the end of the whole course, there's a three hour written exam. That exam can be taken in your local centres. And as you'll see, 60% pass mark, 80% distinction. So on slide 10, the delivery of the program is much more than lectures and slides. There are also, what we're doing now, for example, is recorded. So if you're not available for the lecture, you can catch up later. There are annotated class notes, um, real world case studies, um, and an example here might be, uh, we, we look closely uh, at the experience of RBS in Northern Rock when uh, we go through the liquidity lectures. Uh, we see uh, some sample templates and spreadsheet models, some webinars. Uh, we recently did one on uh, the practical considerations of implementing a large project uh, such as Basel III. Uh, and there are other uh, learning opportunities from a, a library uh, and a forum uh, where I'd be interested to hear the experience of my uh, fellow faculty members, but I would say uh, probably three or four times a week I'm responding to questions on the forum, so there's a lot of lively uh, discussion and debate. Okay. Slide 11, sometimes pictures work better than text, is just a pictorial representation of what I've just explained. Um, one other point I will add is that after the written exams happened, bottom right, um, once you pass that, uh, for those that are keen, there's a diploma module available as well. On slide 12, probably through to 16 or 17, there's a little bit further breakdown of what we cover on the course. Uh, I won't go through these in detail, but I will just put, pull out a, a few items. So firstly, you can tell from slide 12, in the red are the lecturers. Uh, so the lecturers um, can either be single or sometimes we, we team up. Uh, and in the case of ALM trading and hedging, uh, there's three of us. Um, so we, we can team up as, as a group. Um, this particular uh, module is on balance sheet risk management um, and covers some of the high level uh, Basel changes, uh, a lot of the basics around asset and liability management and uh, hedging, trading and interest rate risk management. The high level module two covers the operating model uh, and governance effectively. Module three uh, covers the, some of the market side of things. Uh, so we've got securitization, capital market disciplines, uh, investor relations, credit rating process, and a little bit on recovery and resolution planning. Module four is all about liquidity risk management. Uh, but there's also uh, included in that section um, a lecture on funds transfer pricing. Module five is about capital management. And module six, which is a new one, uh, is about operational risk uh, and a variety of uh, accounting and reporting considerations, uh, as well as, finally, uh, a section on policy documentation. Now, I mentioned these course textbooks earlier. Uh, you'll see, uh, on slide 18, that there are actually nine course textbooks uh, included uh, within the BTRM package. Um, now, the, these cover uh, different aspects of the course. You don't necessarily need to read every single one of these course textbooks from cover to cover, although obviously that would be nice. Uh, but 
Um, there are, uh, should we say, further details in these textbooks on a lot of the areas that you look at in the lectures. Um, slide 19 uh, just gives a little bit more information about the other tools that are available to students. Um, and these in, include uh, working papers on specific topics. Uh, there's the faculty forum videos. So uh, I haven't mentioned it yet, but as well as the lectures, we occasionally hold what's called a, a faculty forum. Uh, and that will be where there's a, 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 a few uh, interesting topics that are current, uh, that are discussed by a series of experts and there are questions uh, from the floor um, to the, uh, the panel. And that's all recorded and available for students to access. Uh, you'll see that there are a variety of other uh, items uh, on that list, which I won't go through now because I've probably mentioned most of them. So on slide 20, uh, BTRM, uh, the qualification uh, is uh, certified or has certification and accreditation. Uh, just to explain what these two bodies are, uh, CPD is around uh, continuous professional development. Um, so there are certain points available uh, by taking this course. And FinRISC uh, is a body that's set up uh, to look at the, the future of the uh, should we say financial risk management globally, uh, and this course is accredited by that body. 21 uh, just gives an idea of uh, some of our recent events and some forthcoming events. So, uh, well, as you'll see from the top line, it was me who gave the webinar on Basel III on the 6th of September. Uh, today's the 14th, so we've got the uh, open evening. And there's a faculty forum uh, on the 29th of September. Um, from the floor here in London, uh, do we know what the main topic of that faculty forum is? Yeah, the, just the just the low level. Oh, uh, pillar two, liquidity risk management. Going, okay. That's actually Enrique's title. So going beyond the LCR, he uh, he has a particular interest. <laughs> but it's looking at between liquidity and then just building below yeah, the, the, the top line. Okay, so uh, just in case uh, you couldn't all hear that from uh, the recording, um, it's uh, the subject matter is pillar two liquidity risk management and uh, what's required beyond the liquidity coverage ratio. Um, 22, you can read at your leisure. We've managed to find a few people who say good things about the course and Naturally, we've written them down and included them here. Um, and 24 uh, is the end of my brief presentation. But what we're now going to do is uh, just go to a panel session. And if there, uh, well, I will ask once we're set up, which will take a, a moment or two, I'll ask the panelists to introduce themselves. And then we will uh, give a quick discussion ourselves on what we think the uh, benefits are of bank treasury risk management and what we've taken out of it individually, um, and then perhaps we'll answer any questions that there are. Okay. Um, so we're, we're back online now uh, for a brief Q&A session. Um, we will, first of all, uh, introduce ourselves. Um, and just to remind you, uh, I work for 20 plus years for NatWestern RBS. And I didn't tell you earlier, but I've been with the uh, Bank Treasury Risk Management since 2014 on the first cohort. Uh, so I'm now looking forward to cohort number five. And to my left is Professor Chowdhury. Thank you very much, Mr. Westcott. And yes, absolutely. Chris has been with us from the start. He's a founding faculty member, as indeed are um, Mr. Eisenhardt today. So actually, you've got the, you've got a core team here, but quite. Uh, this is one thing we're quite just about is the um, is the faculty's breadth and depth. You know, there's all the specific expertise because it's a wide-ranging subject: balance sheet risk management, and banks. Uh, we've now added, as you saw earlier in the presentation, we've added module six, which covers 
uh, there's one whole specific lecture devoted to operational risk, uh, and with from the perspective of finance, treasury, and risk. So there's we're now including a whole other aspects of, of balance sheet risk that drive the red cap calculation, and that's the relevance because obviously op risk can be a material regulatory capital charge. So we've got we're quite pleased that we've got uh, breadth as well as depth in the faculty. Uh, you've heard from Chris Barnes, Moira Chowdhury. We, I was one of the founding faculty members from 2014. Quite exciting to be on cohort five now, and it's an annual cohort from this October. So the program will run every 12 months. The next cohort will be in 2017, October 2017, and uh, it's a longer program now. As Chris said earlier, one to because we've added a sixth module, not just operational risk, but we've added the, uh, the capital and reporting requirements of the trading book. So impact of fundamental review of the trading book. We've added accounting, hedge accounting, and uh, we've added IFRS 9, and uh, a few other bits and pieces as well. Uh, Post-crash discounting of swaps. There are, outside the tier one large banks, there's still a number of people working in relevant areas within banks around the world who aren't aware that the discounting and evaluation of with vanilla derivatives, let alone exotics, has moved on from what they might be reading in textbooks. So uh, we've added lots of uh, new material, all very relevant to, to balance sheet risk management, and we've added to the faculty for that. So that's one reason it's a longer program, just over eight months, but also we've built in some breaks. There's two stages. If you've seen, if you've seen the brochure, please pick up the, 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 the cohort five brochure from the website. Uh, we, we've also put in some, some revision and break time. So there is uh, there's the, the Christmas and the Easter breaks. There's also a review session for the online tests halfway through and at the end. So we can re you can review the, what's behind the answers. You know, it's all very well to do a multiple choice exam, but why is this answer, you know, why is it A and not C? So there are review sessions. And of course, between the end of the, the course itself, the taught part of the program and the exam, which is a four week period, there is also a, a preparation, exam preparation and revision session again, on a Wednesday evening, so or your, your local time zone if you dial in, <laughs> um, which we, we think will also help the whole uh, exam, re, examination preparation uh, process. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where we are now. One other thing I should add, also different to cohort five, is there will also be, for the first time, and something else we're quite proud of, a detailed course handbook. So normally when one attends the lecture, one gets the PowerPoint slides and there are the references to reading. You saw the, the books that you are sent as part of your enrollment process. Uh, we're now going to have an accompanying textbook, if you like. So very similar to what uh, one would get in other professional programs when there is an actual accompanying textbook. So that will be for students. It will have a summary and the key points in each of the, that are in each chapter relevant to each lecture. So there's 27 lectures in all of the 27 odd chapters. So it's, it's, it's a substantial work, and we think that's good value added and will be very useful to students. Again, that's also a new development for cohort five, the, the student handbook or the course handbook, uh, which will cover each lecture and will be adept. It adds to what's in the PowerPoint slides that you will receive, um, that you get every lecture. The handbook should be ready. If it's not ready for the 12th of October, start of the cohort, it'll certainly be ready in October. So hopefully, and besides, you don't really need it for the primer, do you? <laughs> so um, that, we're quite chuffed with that as well. I think that's all I'll say at this point, uh, Mr. Eisenhower. Yeah, I guess the only reason why I keep involved and keep coming is because I want to know what the heck's going to happen next. <laughs> um, it's never a dull moment. I think that's the important thing in the course that we're that we all have a practitioner background, and that's important to keeping up, keeping pace, uh, keeping relevant. Um, think of the autumn we have in front of us, um, whether it's the regulators as they continue to uh, implement Basel III. They claim there's no Basel IV, but that's interesting because everybody else is working really hard on it right now. <laughs> and um, in terms of monetary policy, well, what's going on there? Um, and how do you run a bank with this outrageously um, aggressive monetary policy we have here? Uh, last week, for the first time, uh, a French corporation borrowed money for 10 years, and the investor paid to give them money. And you have to say, well, I'm a bank. How am I going to make money doing that? Um, we're going to fight for high-quality high liquid assets. Um, and certainly, it's not just about the super low interest rates, but it's also about 
the, the markets themselves and the quantitative easing programs and um, central banks not just buying government paper but also buying corporate paper. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I guess I echo the comments about uh, the educational value of the program on both sides, really. Uh, personally, I've learned a great deal from colleagues and from students uh, in the course of the program. Now, the journey taking us into cohort five, uh, the saying, he who teaches learns, definitely applies here. Um, and what I truly appreciate is the varied perspectives uh, that one gets uh, from the participants here, which include uh, people from regulatory uh, institutions, Treasury and risk professionals, uh, representatives from large banks, small banks, uh, from consulting firms, from central banks, and so on. And I think a, another unique and very value-added part of the program is the inclusion of guest lecturers from time to time, who are drawn from the world of professional practice, by and large. Uh, they are slotted into the weekly sessions uh, as the topics uh, present themselves. And I think that adds a lot to the, the overall experience, and uh, no doubt will be um, making uh, use of that in cohort five as well. Yes, thank you. And I've forgotten that. That's a good point. We, we, um, again, we don't, uh, my father always said, if you can't say anything nice about someone, don't say anything at all. So mm -hmm. I, won't, <laughs> I won't mention, uh, you know, competitive phrase, but I, I think if you just look at BTRM, getting in guests who are practitioners themselves, so they're right at the cold face right now in that specific area. So let's say we've got a lecture this Wednesday evening or next Wednesday evening on, you know, Bolster 3 liquidity. Getting in someone in who is in charge of, you know, liquidity risk management at a, for example, a, a challenger bank or a new bank or you know, a foreign bank, a different perspective. He's so, so it's a person who is doing it right now adds to the, the, the learning experience for the students. Uh, and I don't think, I mean, I'm pretty sure, because I'm very familiar with other professional qualifications in this space, you know, in finance, and one just doesn't have that. One gets a textbook and, and a trainer will talk out the textbook and that's pretty much it. We, we are all practitioners or former practitioners, some of us are current practitioners on the faculty, but we, we're bringing the, the, the banking perspective, but we're bringing in people who also do this now for a living, and I think that also adds to the student learning experience. So it's a, definitely a, a USP, as the, the entrepreneur would call it, for BTIM. Right, I think that's, um, that's all the introductions done. Are there any questions online, Werner, or in the room? Um, so the question in the room is um, for people who enroll for the program, are there any inclusion or exclusion criteria? Forgive me, I, I'm not quite <laughs> sure what you mean. Uh, qualification? Oh, I see, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, actually, there is some text in the, um, you can pass me the brochure. There is some text in the brochure on that, so that's a very good question you ask. And um, where does it say? I'll just. I can't imagine being overqualified. <laughs> <laughs> There's no. Ex okay, that must be in the student guide. Forgive me. I, I thought there was something in the brochure. That's that's a that's that. I'm no way you've asked that question because it's not answer the question. We are. This is a. We are in the process, it's a long process, it takes several years of getting a university formal accreditation for this program. It, um, and it, this is being, this is actually presented as a level, what in the UK education uh, criteria we call a level seven qualification. So it's a, it's, a, it's a graduate level qualification. In other words, it's at the level of a master's degree. Now because it's, and this is, some, this is something that's in the, in the brochure, um, because it's um, equivalent to 300 hours of learning, so 80 hours of actual teaching, uh, you know, present lectures, and then the balance, 220 hours of self-directed learning, including exam and the revision, that's equivalent to, to, um, to 30 credits, which is like one semester. So it's, it would be, if it was being awarded by an education body, it would be a certificate. The diploma module, which is optional, would be equivalent to a diploma. Uh, but it's at that, it's a graduate certificate or graduate uh, diploma. Uh, if we were to you know, tri triple the length of it, it'd be a master's level qualification. So that would imply that the inclusion criteria is already an undergraduate degree in a reasonably numerate subject like um, uh, finance, business, economics, uh, yeah, th th these areas. So that, I wouldn't say they're very, there's not a formal rigid tick box, you have to have a numerate BA degree and experience in the markets. What I would suggest is you need to have 
a level of educational attainment that enables you to be comfortable with a graduate level qualification. But we're very happy to review each application on its own merit. I wouldn't say this is a qualification for a complete beginner, someone who has no experience at all in finance and doesn't have the undergrad degree probably wouldn't get the best out of it. Does that mean they wouldn't necessarily be accepted? Not necessarily, but they wouldn't get the best out of it. I think a combination of one or two years of experience in finance and or the undergrad degree are probably the best criteria for inclusion. I can't think that there are any criteria for exclusion. <laughs> you know, I think anyone who wishes, to, you know, we, we didn't, we had a CFO. We had someone who was a CFO, he wasn't the CFO of UBS, but he was basically at the CFO level of one of their legal entities, isn't he? So we have had very senior people attending. At the same time, we've had very junior people, though. We, yes, we've had bank treasurers. We also had um, a young um, Abu Kar. He was, uh, he was quite junior. Um, so we've, got, we've had the whole range, but generally they're, with, they're at that level where they've had a few years' experience in finance and they have got grad, uh, undergrad degrees. Could I uh, just maybe add one point? A, lo a lot of the lectures do start at the beginning. Um, yeah. So they don't suddenly jump in and, and assume a huge amount of knowledge. Um, so from that perspective, a, a lecture in itself is, say, self-contained uh, and yeah. you don't need to know a lot. What I would say, though, is with, when you have 20, large, 25, 26, how many are there now? 27. 27. When you have 27 of these, if you have no background at all in the subject, then the sheer number of... 27 would, would be quite a lot, hence it's useful if you've got some background. But in, in themselves, each lecture, Absolutely. You, you don't you know, you come in not knowing much about yeah. the subject. And, that, and that's actually where it's a, a key benefit. So it's quite common uh, fairly early in your career that you may have an ex had exposure to one part of asset and liability management. So you might work in the liquidity risk team, or you might... Uh, be involved in providing some consultancy service in that area. Uh, so the benefit here is we will hopefully broaden the experience of people who come from teams like that, but also tell them about all the other aspects of asset and liability management and treasury risk. Yeah, I think it helps when you deal with somebody else in the bank. And why are they telling me this? And it doesn't make sense to me. Um, so you get their perspective without having worked in that job. And I think it's also good if you deal with clients. Um, why is the bank quoting this crazy lending rate? Um, you know, you, you would have some basis for having a good discussion with Treasury and doing the best for your client. Uh, I can't see one. Yes, read it out. So, so, so how much one-to-one -one support do you get to the organization? Okay, so that's a very good question. How much one-to-one -one support do you get during the duration of the course? Um, so this is a global, I mean, the answer is a lot. <laughs> you, you, you get plenty of support as required. Some people require more input and assistance and support and some people don't. Some, it's often in any course, by my own personal experience going back many years and also on BTRM, generally it's, it's, it's a certain group of individuals who will ask questions and others who who sell, they, 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 they start on lecture one, they finish lecture one, they do the exam, and you never ever hear a peep out of them, and they pass, or they get extinct or something. Um, we have the on, this is a global qualification, so it's, it's a distance learning, uh, but also based in London. We have the online forum. The online forum is where you can post a question, and we guarantee a response within 24 hours from a member of the faculty. Uh, and by response, I don't mean we've seen it, thanks. We'll come back to you. I mean an answer to your question. So we guarantee an answer to your question. Um, if we need further work, we will, of course, state that. Within 24 hours, you can post a question that's arisen out of the blue. You might have a, we had one chap, uh, he's a corporate treasurer in the US, actually, who has been sending questions on the forum that are specific problems that he is encountering in his day job. They aren't related to the lectures. The more common questions coming up on the forum are in response to a lecture. You know, we've posted additional materials on the forum. So the one-to-one -one support is, we recommend it's via the forum. So you post the question there, and often that gets other people involved as well, so we can share the problem, share the solution. But at the end of the day, if you require input directly, then all our faculty emails are stated. The brochure, the student guide, 
Uh, so not the brochure, but the cohort five student <coughs> guide, which all students will be getting very shortly. We've just we're about to, we're just printing it. Um, it has the email, the d direct email addresses of all faculty members. So you can actually direct your query straight to them. That's not a problem. And all our faculty will respond straight away. That's what we're like. But I do recommend you go through the forum. One goes through the forum because then, as I said, a problem aired is a problem shared. No. Problem shared is, you know what, you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> a problem solved is done through collective action. <laughs> um, that, that's the best way to do it. But like I said, all our faculty are available on a one-to-one -one basis. Those based in London, I must admit, or those attending the lectures online live will benefit from live questioning. So if you're in the room, you can ask the lecturer during or during the break or during the lecture. If you are attending online, you can direct your question as you have done now, and that will get a live response. If you are watching it in your own time, the forum is, is the next best thing and, and usually solves the problem. There's another question. Uh, what is the objective of this? I'd love to hear the chap's response to okay. this, but I'll just let me let me just quickly just say both. If you're working in Treasury, Mr. Westcott made a point that you know often, especially at the larger banks, people are very specialized. They yeah, they will work specifically in intraday liquidity or liquidity or funds transfer pricing or or, or, or capital planning, you know, they're specific, you know, model validation. They will be in specific areas. If they're, if they're already in treasury and looking to, to, to build on their career in treasury or balance sheet risk, then of course the BTRM is, is tailor-made to assist you in that process because it gives you that much wider picture. The whole balance sheet, both sides of the balance sheet, integrating assets and liabilities, ALM process. If you want to break into treasury, of course the BTRM, when one sees its content, You'll straight away be emerging as, 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 if not necessarily a practiced expert, a knowledgeable person in the treasury space. So I would say both. I would say it would assist both people. And of course, the BTRM, you saw the numbers of students, it's getting, there are more alumni every year. It's they're around the world. So the bigger it gets, the more instantly recognized it is. You know, that's a process of time. It assesses that breaking in process. Chris, you had a comment? Uh, I was just going to highlight that uh, there's a, uh, value also if you're outside Treasury completely because there's uh, a, a large body of people who see Treasury and asset and liability management as a bit of a dark art um, and it's not uh, and by uh, spending the 80 hours of learning um, uh, from experts uh, it helps you understand the, the whole subject matter and see how it all pieces together. I was once uh, told that uh, to solve any risk management or treasury risk management type problem in a bank, you only needed to know nine or ten things. Uh, the challenge is working out what are the nine or ten things you need to know. Um, and I think uh, the course helps you uh, hugely with, with that um, because when you're, when you're in the workplace with one of those tricky problems that touches a bit of credit, a bit of treasury risk, a bit of operational risk and so on and so forth, uh, it, it's so much more difficult to solve if you don't know anything about the world of asset and liability management. If you just know some of the key principles, it can help hugely in these day-to-day uh, -day problems we face. Yeah, absolutely. Did you? It, was that hurt on the no, Okay. So, <laughs> so the question in the room was um, the support functions have also benefited from this, whether you work in IT support for Treasury, quantitative analyst. I mean, there was a quantitative analyst in the last two cohorts. Uh, one of the quantitative is asking a lot of questions, isn't it? It's the um, chap from one of the high street banks. Um, absolutely. I, I always think, you know, if you're working in the consulting field, if you are advising on the Treasury space, if you are a business analyst who works with the Treasury Department or finance and risk, finance or risk, quantitative analysis, uh, IT, internal audit. You know, I always, if you look at one of the lectures, talk about ALCO governance, who should be the members of the Asset Liability Committee of a bank. There are people who attend ALCO, Asset Liability Committee in banks around the world, who aren't necessarily finance, risk or treasury people. You know, but if you're, if you're attending ALCO, you would definitely benefit from, and you're in a support function, you would benefit from this. So absolutely, I think the support functions also get uh, some material value out of this.
Okay. All right. Done from questions, no. <laughs> we solved, have we? We've answered all your questions. Okay. <laughs> okay, well thanks very much. Thanks, Mr. Westcott. Appreciate it, gentlemen. Thanks, Mr. Thank and, you. Uh, and thank you for tuning in.